Hey, everybody. This is Bunny Pounds coming to you with another conversation with Christians Engage. We are taking a break from our rewatching of the messages from our 2021 Wake Up Conference. And we're going to talk about our book club episode today. You know, we have a monthly book club. We like actually read books. And so we want to encourage you to turn off that Netflix channel. Stop binge watching every two seconds and actually educate yourself on what the Bible has to say about the issues. Read good theology books. Read books that inspire you on prayer. Read good books about government. So this month we are featuring Frederick Bostiak's book, The Law. Now, this was written in the 1800s. Now, this book has had huge impact on many, many people in the conservative movement. And so today, I am deeply honored that I get to have the man who gave me this book as a Christmas present, my former boss, Congressman Jeb Henserling. How are you, Jeb? Bonnie, I too am honored to be with you. I'm so proud of what you have achieved I am so glad the Lord touched your heart to take up this movement and uh, to think that you and I were together uh, back in the day. You have done so much. And anyway, it just warms my heart. It's great to be with you. And by the way, your book club must be one of three in America that actually reads the book. (laughs) Yes. So we want to encourage you guys to read the book. Last week, last month, we read Jonathan Kahn's The Harbinger and Harbinger 2. And then next month, we'll be reading Dr. Jim Garlow's book, Well-Versed, which deals with a whole bunch of issues. So, But this is very short, guys. Pick this up on Amazon or wherever you get your books right now and read this. But we're going to talk about that. But yeah, my history, Jeb, you know, you know kind of follows your history. So I started with you. Many people know Um, We share about my story with you in our on-ramp to civic engagement seminar that a lot of people have taken. But, you know, I started as your campaign manager right when you were becoming the Republican Study Committee chair in the U.S. House. Then you went on to be conference chairman, which is the fourth most powerful person in the U.S. House, by the way, guys, the communication person. And then you went on to be the financial services chairman, dealing with everything financial services. Um, I mean... 16 years in Congress, and by the way, one of the great honorable people with integrity and conservative members that never compromised. What was one of your rewarding moments, and what were some of the challenges? Because people (laughs) send people to D.C., and they're like, "Uh, I don't even know what these people do. Well, when you ask about challenges, how much time do we have for this (laughs) podcast? I would say this, Bunny. Um, I'm not sure there's one particular moment. People frequently ask me, I guess this is a little bit of a wrinkle on your question, do you miss being out of public office? I would say what I miss is the camaraderie of kind of like-minded, like-hearted people who, um, you know, by modern terms, sacrificed um, to serve their country, how their hearts and heads were touched. They understood that America was exceptional. Listen, as you know, I never served my country in uniform. I worked in air-conditioned comfort. Um, But as Churchill once said, in combat you can die once, in politics you can die many times over. So it can be a tough, brutal, full-contact sport, as you well know. But it's just that camaraderie that you shared in the trenches with other kind of soldiers who cared about life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness and know that our rights are God-given. So number one, it's just the camaraderie. I miss those people. Um, And then for most of us, we felt a calling. I used to pray about this all the time, whether or not I should, should run. And I think the Lord put that opportunity before me. And so, you know, I miss that particular kind of noble sense of purpose uh, in the life. I very much enjoy now finally being a full-time husband and father and breadwinner for my family. So I'm not sure it was one moment. Um, You know, in Congress, ultimately, you want to get laws passed that advances the cause. So in my last term, uh, it was nice to go over to the Oval Office and attend a bunch of signing ceremonies and end up with a bunch of presidential signing pins that I uh, flatter myself that one day my children will treasure. 
Well, I love your story, too, because you focused in. I talk to people all the time, you know, they can't bear the burdens of everything happening in America, right? There's so many problems. Like, how do you even get your head wrapped around it? And members of Congress, I use you as an example all the time. Members of Congress can't even get all their heads wrapped around all the problems. So you were are you very skilled at focusing in on what you felt like you were supposed to put your hands to and what you were called to do and 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 made a difference. Um, you know, how do you encourage people that might feel called into public office or they're like, you know, I should like experiment with this whole government thing. I'm sure you get that question all the time. How do you just encourage them in that? Well, I recall um, our former vice president, Mike Pence, frequently quoting John Quincy Adams. Uh, Ours is duty, outcomes belong to the Lord. So in some respects, you can't worry about ultimately um, what is going to be the short-term impact of your actions. The question is, do you feel that call to duty? Um, I felt it. Others feel it. And so, again, you can't worry about the short-term outcomes. Um, I mean, the Lord has his purposes. And also you have to realize that, I mean, for example, John Quincy Adams, I mean, he spent decades and decades fighting slavery. And he didn't get to see the culmination of his life's work. But ultimately, what he did was built upon uh, by others. Uh, And ultimately, as we all know, the slaves were free at a very high cost. But they were freed. So, you know, you ought to feel blessed that you have the opportunity. I felt blessed um, that I could speak out about the causes of life and liberty, the pursuit of happiness, constitutional governments. We the people, and and people would actually pay attention to what I said, and I do believe later in my career, uh, it was satisfying to know you actually had some impact. Now, I do recall another quote of Jefferson, um, the cause of liberty is to be gained in inches. I think sometimes may be measured in millimeters. (laughs) But, you know, uh, there were a few battles won. I take some solace from that. Um, So I would just tell people, you know, be encouraged at the opportunity. And if you feel that call, answer that call. Well, and you used to call me every now and then I'd be in the middle of a fundraising pitch or something. You go, how's the work of the ministry, right? (laughs) Senator Graham told you that. And it really is for those of us that have been involved in it. um, It is really a calling that people need to consider that maybe the Lord's calling you into it. And part of what we're doing with Christians Engage is trying to raise up strong people of faith to get involved in this space, because you and I both know there's not enough people of faith, you know, getting in the middle of some of the muck and mire. Well, hard. And, and Bunny, as you know, not everybody has to run for public office, just like everybody doesn't have to be a prophet. Everybody doesn't have to be a teacher. So I, I would say this. I mean, you people need to pray over it. But if you're going to help the disease, shouldn't you know something about health care public policy? Because it has such an impact um, on God's children here in America. And if you want to help the poor— Shouldn't you know something about welfare policy? Um, And so I I just think it's not something you can you can ignore if you want to help the poor, if you want to help the diseased, if you want to help the children. You have to know something about education policy, because what the government does, what the state does has such an impact on our ability um, to uh, to care for our neighbor's needs. Yes, yes. And that's one thing you've always taught me is to do go above and beyond with my research and be excellent at what we do. And so you don't have to run for office, but you could be a staffer or you can help people be a you know policy researcher. There's a thousand different jobs in government and politics that you can get involved with. Okay, before we move on from your personal life. So, you know, I just am not, a campaign manager anymore for 16 years. I've been running members of Congress's campaigns. And I realized that 
there's something in my internal clock that is always connected to working all the time, right? Because it's part of who I am. I mean, it's like who I've been for 16 years. So, you know, what is something that you get to do, Jeb, now you didn't get to do before (laughs) because your schedule always controlled your life? Uh, Well, I mentioned it earlier, so I'm not proud of the fact, but you know, my family made a sacrifice. People occasionally, when I was a member of Congress, thank me for my sacrifices. I haven't sacrificed a thing. People in uniform sacrifice, and my family sacrificed. I don't sacrifice a thing. So I, I alluded to it earlier. Um, you know, Bunny, you know this, but my wife and I are on the verge of being empty nesters. So it was nice that for a few years I could be a full-time father and hopefully have that lasting impact on my children. But otherwise, I would say I've discovered, rediscovered family, friends, books, weekends. I never knew what a weekend was (laughs) when I was in public office, and I'm sure you don't know what a weekend is uh, either. I say that facetiously. Again, hearkening back to our former vice president, who I think you know, Weba is a dear friend of mine. We served in the House together, and he taught me one of the most important lessons, and that was, you know, truly honor the Sabbath and take the day off. Not all of my colleagues did, but it was important to my wife to know there was one day a week that I would not be a member of Congress. Um So I'm enjoying that. You know, I wouldn't, you know, there's about a six month detox program from leaving uh, (laughs) public office. You have to get your adrenaline level back to uh, normal human levels. Normal human, yes. Uh, But you can have a very rich and rewarding and satisfying life. Uh, you know, and I am, I'm serving God's children in other ways. I mean, I could show you the pair of shorts and tennis shoes I ruined the other day for participating in a church project, helping paint the houses of low-income people. It wasn't exactly a a, a professional job, but we left the houses (laughs) looking better than when we arrived. And, uh, you know, I thought if the Lord could uh, wash the feet of his disciples, the least I could do is sweat and paint a house. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, yeah, figuring out what real life looks like outside of uh, Washington, D.C. is a, a challenge. Okay, so... I worked for you for 10 years and you gave us a book. It seemed like every Christmas you got it. We got a different book um, signed by you, which is so sweet. Um, but this was one that was just amazing. And I want to quote the law. Each one of us has a natural right from God to defend his person, his liberty and his property. The state is a substitution of a common force for individual forces to defend this right. Um, so a Frenchman wrote this. After the French Revolution, um, and he interacted with government a lot. Talk to us about uh, how you saw the world and how this little book helped you see the role of government specifically. One, for those versed in kind of foundational liberty, this is one of the most important works that a lot of modern thought is based upon. So Bastiat was... An economist, he was an author, and he was a statesman as well. And what he saw after the French Revolution, what he saw after two failed attempts at a republic, he saw French governance in society starting to lapse into socialism. And he feared from there would go to communism. And so what he was really doing is pushing back upon the powers of the day to reestablish that our rights are natural, that they come uh, from our creator who has endowed us with these principles. And to some extent, he was paraphrasing Jefferson as well, who paraphrased others. Um, And so he pushed back and he really laid the foundation again that rights come from God. They don't come from man. And the purpose of state is really defensive, to defend our rights. And and that government is simply a corporate way of defending individual 
uh, rights. And so he spoke quite eloquently. Uh, and I must admit, if you read the original English translations. It's still kind of in a a 19th century prose. That's a little difficult to read through. I'm reading a biography of Jefferson now. It has a lot of quotes and kind of the same thing, but there are a lot of modern translations uh, of the law. And I must admit at my ripe old age, I don't quite remember which translation I I gave you. And and it's not really a book. It's It's a pamphlet. And it's an extended pamphlet. But again, it talks about uh, the government engaging in legal plunder. Uh, It talks about kind of greed and false philanthropy, which, again, this is a book that just cries out for what we see happening to the state today uh, in America, where you see this Leviathan. And and, and Bastiat talked about how government grows and puts its tentacles into every facet of our lives. And we lose our ability to determine what is the course of our life, what is the course of our family's life. And he talks about plunder where people ultimately are incented, as I like to put it in my day, not to compete in the marketplace, but to compete in the halls of Congress for pork barrel, for special tax credits, uh, for appropriations to barriers to entry. And so, again, that corrupts the idea of what government should do. It corrupts our ability to be an innovative society that really liberates the talents uh, of our people to experiment and to innovate. And then on the other side, as far as false philanthropy, it's like, oh, pity that poor person over there. I think I'll take my neighbor's treasure away from him and give it to her. And not really understanding how often, how, how unfortunate it is that a lot of that poverty was created by the state anyway. And that, as you know, unfortunately, there's, there's such a concept as kind of toxic charity. And you start off giving a handout and somebody is grateful. And then all of a sudden you go from charity um, to expectation to dependency to resent and victimization. And so as Bastiat pointed out, I want to help the poor person, but I don't believe it is the state in our society. He believed in civil society. He was a devout Catholic. And so he knew about the ability of his fellow man of civic organizations that de Tocqueville saw in early America, that he thought America was unique and that it could create civil society to address local problems. And Bastiat said, you know, we're capable of that in France uh, as well. So again, when I think about kind of the top 10 works that lay down the foundation of, 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 of kind of the intellectual and philosophical foundation of liberty, the law is clearly in that top 10. Well, and it's one of the things that we don't really think about, you know, that the tentacles of government can actually steal parts of our freedom, right? And I remember when you first went to Congress, you were all about earmark reform, you know, and everybody's like, what? Why are we even talking about this? You know, but you kept going, no, it's a culture of spending that we need to deal with. It might only be one percent of the federal budget, but it's a culture of spending. And then you dealt with all these other things that nobody wanted to deal with. Fannie and Freddie and (laughs) troubled assets and, you know, flood insurance and everywhere that the government was continuing to take over little bits of control uh, of their life and and taxpayers were on the hook, right? Talk to us for just a second about taxpayer responsibility and I mean our national debt and everything that we're continuing to see spiral. Jeff. Well, first, and it's both sides of the aisle, yeah, Republicans yeah, and Democrats. Yeah. Well, first, Bunny, I want to make it clear, and you heard me say this many, many times, the public policy that I was mainly focused on in Congress, I did not consider the most important. It wasn't as important as the cause of life. It wasn't as important as the cause of religious liberty. It may have not been as important as, as the cause of national defense. But as one who majored in economics and spent a lot of time studying it, 
this was kind of my area of specialty, and I do think it is important even today. Again, I, I joked about how much time do you have to hear about my regrets uh, in Congress. Certainly among my greatest regrets is my inability to convince more of my congressional colleagues and more of my fellow citizens about the peril of the national debt and the morality, rather the immorality, of leaving the next generation with this burden of debt to where they may be the first generation in America's history to have a lower standard of living should America become a second-rate military power, economic power, and I'd argue moral authority. And I always thought also, one, you had to lead by example. And it's not my quote, but the late, great Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma, one of the greatest statesmen I ever served with, used to say that earmarks are the gateway drug to spending addiction. And I also was just a huge um, um, proponent that we had to, again, have market competition, not congressional competition, not lobbyists lined up you know, three deep thick in the hallways trying to get some kind of special uh, privilege because then once you take that money, you lose your moral authority. You can never deal with the portions of social welfare that are corrupted if you don't deal with the portions of corporate welfare that are corrupted. And so, again, I cared about the debt, but I also cared about this incredible engine of prosperity that feeds America, clothes America, houses America, called the free enterprise system. And it's not just for the bounty that they give society. It's not just for helping our people avoid uh, hunger and ill health. But it also is, and again, hearkening back to Bastiat, it's about using God's gift and and using your talents in nature to create and to give you the self-satisfaction of your creation, of earning your own success, and to, to put people on either corporate welfare or individual welfare who shouldn't be there really takes away their ability to, um, to pursue happiness. Yes. And so yes. on so many different levels, I attempted to battle, again, corporate welfare, spending access that took away from future generations. Um, I wish I had seen greater success on my watch, but again, hearkening back, Ours is duty, outcomes belong to the Lord. And I am just heartened that there is a new generation of those committed to the cause who will uh, take up this fight as I attempt to uh, decrease the surplus bass population in East Texas. (laughs) Well, that's an important economic job that you have on your hands there. So, you know, Christians, a lot of times, and I know this interview is a little longer, but I want you to hear from my great boss a former boss, but you're always my boss. Um, Christians are very concerned, you know, as you mentioned, the life issue, religious liberty issues, those have been the things we've been kind of seen as, um, you know, working on. But number one, why should Christians get more educated on what's happening on the fiscal side of things? Um, And why should these issues be a moral outcry that we're working against and then also, you know, how how can one Christian really make a difference? I mean, our whole goal is to get Christians moving in prayer, voting and engagement. How have you seen people in your life, even as a member, um, walk beside you and really change things? Well, I think we all know 11 apostles made a difference. <laughs> uh, and particularly um, St. Peter and St. Paul made a difference. So one should never underestimate their ability to make a difference. Uh, and we see many, many close elections uh, in our nation. And again, I know you're not here. I'm not here to tell people how to think. But I think we're here to make the case that you cannot ignore public policy and you cannot be indifferent as to spending your children's and grandchildren's uh, inheritance. 
I mean, I would argue, uh, and I know there may be good men and women on the other side, but I would argue that's a form of theft. It is a form of theft to take wealth away from future generations and use it for your purposes. Uh, I mean, how can you... It's just not something in my own heart, in my own head, as I've been touched, uh, that I can do. So these fiscal issues should not be ignored. And again, if you believe, and as I believe, liberty, free enterprise is simply liberty applied to commerce. And I've had a lot of different blessings in my life, uh, but I've been able to do to travel internationally. And if you haven't been to certain parts of Africa, if you haven't been to certain parts of Latin America or India, you haven't seen real poverty in America. I mean, there are places where the human suffering uh, is simply incredible. Yes. And where you find it, you will not, what you typically find are kind of... um, corrupt autocratic kleptocracies that consist of the very, very rich and the elite with everybody else being subservient and poor. Again, if you care about the lot in life of our fellow citizens and even the citizens of the world, public policy created that poverty and oppression. It was created by having an autocratic state. It was created by having a socialist form of government. It was created by having what Bastiat called legal plunder, where too many businesses made their profit, not good profit from competition. They, it was bad profit from special privilege granted by the governing elite. So, again, there are just so many reasons that I would hope and pray people would not ignore public policy. And, again, I can't – I'm not here to tell them what policy that they should embrace. But I am here to say you have to pray long and hard whether you want to put your head in the sand. Um, One of my favorite songs – I probably date myself – that dates back to the 70s, but it's a – a song by Neil Young, and there's a line, how can you run when we know? How can we run away from what is happening in governance and public policy and see how it's taking the God-granted gifts we have away? How can you run when you know? Uh, You can't. You have to get in the fight. (laughs) You got to get in the fight. You know, I remember showing up at your front door and going, I think I'm going to run for Congress for your seat. Like, what was I thinking, Jeb? What was I thinking? Um, But, you know, God uses these situations in our lives to get us where he wants us to be. Right. And for me, that was a step that I needed to get where I am today. You know, we've been in 95 churches around Texas, launched a team in Pennsylvania. We're scaling our communication system for the nation now, all 50 states. And, you know, God is trying to to move us by steps of obedience. And I, I think that's what you're inspiring us to do is just start somewhere, read a book, right? Get educated, um, pick up your Bible every now and then. Guys, don't be one of the just the 6% of American Christians that ever reads their Bible outside of church. Um, you know, educate yourself and then move forward. And that's what we do here at Christians Engage, you know, is give people basic practical steps to move forward. So anyway, you taught me a little bit about that. (laughs) You know, try to take big messages and simplify it down so that people can understand uh, and get their heads wrapped around it. So just know that your impact, guys, walking beside members of Congress, adopting a candidate can change everything. So my last pitch before I let Jeb go is, We just re-recorded our on-ramp to civic engagement seminar for the nation. So over 1,200 people have taken this seminar, a seven-hour seminar in Texas, and now it's launched for the nation. Our friends at Intercessors for America are pushing pushing that out nationally as well. Um, But we want you to take this. Seven hours of videos, guys. I actually share my story. Um, Walking beside Congressman Henserling and um, the vice president, former vice president of the United States, Mike Pence. But... Take that seminar. I'm going to teach you about party politics, advocacy, issues from a biblical perspective. 
We've got our friends at First Liberty teaching you about the role of the courts and the separation of church and state and the Johnson Amendment and all that fun stuff. And our friends at Time to Revive teach you how to share the gospel. And then you end the final two hours with me talking to you about how to walk in politics and still protect your soul. You absolutely need this seminar. So it's only 29 bucks. I mean, that's like nothing. And get it for your small group. We have small group licenses and church licenses. So I'll end with this. Um, Jeb, how can people just take one step of obedience? Like, what's your final spoke of inspiration to just get them moving? Care. 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 Understand that public policy has an impact on your ability to serve your fellow man. Um, so if, if that's what you are called to do, it's what Christ calls us to do. Care first, understand second, engage, engage. and work. But care is the first step. You got to care before you can do anything else. Well, and we both know that whether we care about government or not, government cares about you. <laughs> <laughs> not always in a positive not way. Not always in a positive way. So if we don't pay attention, um, things happen. So let's pay attention as believers and be that light and salt that God's called us to do in our nation. Thank you, Congressman Jeb Henserling. Blessing to be here. Mm-hmm.